Greetings all. Um, this meeting is now actually being recorded, which is nice so that people will be able to go back at some point in the future and watch it. Um, my name is Perry Lamb. I am the superintendent of the Piedmont Division of the NMRA. Welcome to our February meeting. Um, this is starting in April of last year. We've had continuous content out except for July. July we did not because July we usually don't have a formal regular meeting. We do something like a pizza party or a barbecue and and um, we did not do that that last year because of obvious reasons. Um, hopefully we will be back at that this July. Um, Sally Bando is our Director of Operations. She is the <laughs> keeper of the meeting agenda. So, Sally. Yes, sir. Are you ready? I are ready. Okay. First, I want to welcome everybody to our meeting. And we just came up with a brainstorm of saying, um, if you're new to the Piedmont Division meetings, let us know. So... Is anybody um, interested? Uh, there's a few names that I have not seen before. If you would introduce yourself, that would be great. And and I'm going to unmute people for just a for just a little bit, and then un and then go back and remute them and unmute people like Sally and so on. But I'd like to if you're if you hold the the background conversation down we'll be able to get people in and 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 hear from them so i have unmuted anybody who wants to unmute themselves and um that way you can or please please greet us and say hi if, especially if you're if you're new to us russ have you visited us before oh he's on mute Oh, well, I've I've asked. Oh, wait a I've, minute. I've participant unmute all. Mm. Allow allow attendees to unmute themselves. So that's what I've ah. set it for. Okay. So people should be able to unmute themselves if they'd like to speak and say hi. So to do that, you go to your name, and you push the little red microphone. Yep. So, let's see. But first, they have they have to uh, make sure they're showing the participant list. Oh, okay. Uh, and if they're not showing in the participant list, it may not work. Well, if they don't have the participant list showing or up. Oh. You know, right, because that you have to select and, and make come up. Down in the lower right-hand corner is, is, a, is a space for chat and is a space for um participants and if you click on the participant you'll get the participant list and you can show yourselves and speak so russ have you found that yes okay have you been to one of our meetings before? i have been to quite a few of the meetings uh half and a I dozen or so back pre-covid obviously Oh, okay. Well, oh, we're glad you're here tonight. Um, let's see, who else do we have in here? Stefan. Oh, Larry Millican. I haven't seen his name come up too often. Have you been to any of our virtual meetings? Larry? Hmm. Well, maybe this isn't as yes. good an idea as we thought. <laughs> Yeah, it might, this might not have been a good, good plan. <laughs> here. Oh, good. We're, Hi. We're trying. Oh, okay. And Andy Tourville? Yeah, that's a new name for me. Yeah. So, anyway, let's get on with it. This yeah. is not working as well as we expected. <laughs> um, so, the first thing on the, the agenda tonight is announcements. And, Terry, you wanted to talk about training camp? Yes, ma'am. I most certainly do. Um, our first training camp of the year was Model Railroading 101. Um, that was really successful. We've had well over 700 
YouTube views on the two different channels, both the NMRA YouTube channel and then our own channel um, combined have had over 700 views of, of Model Railroading 101. Um, our next two training camps are going to be virtual. Um, we're doing that for obvious reasons, but the nice thing, but the nice thing about doing these as virtual clinics is that we don't have to put a limit on the number of people who attend. Um, in May, at the at the very end of May, the last Saturday in May, um, pull up the date really quickly. May 29th of 2021, we're going to have a repeat of um, weathering um, rolling stock. That clinic has been heavily modified based on um, what we did for the British region in November of last or October and November of last year. That that clinic has been heavily modified. If you're interested in learning, relearning how to weather your rolling stock. Um, that clinic will be open, that, that training camp will be open. And then on July 31st, we will be doing a repeat. Um, this is the first time in two years that we will have done a repeat of building a wooden structure kit. Um, we'll be working again with bar mills, um, structure kits, wooden structure kits. If you are interested in participating in that clinic, um, and we'll get registration for both of these open soon, um, but we'll send you a list of materials. The structure kits are ava will be available through Blue Ox Trains at, a, at, an, at an increased discount to class participants. And it is quite likely that we will actually have um, staff from Bar Mills partially teach that clinic. So it should be a really good learning experience if you're interested in learning how to build structure kits, wooden structure kits. The last time we ran that clinic, it sold out and that was the end of it. And, and we have not done that clinic since. So those will be our, those are our next two virtual training camps. Thanks, Sally. Okay, and did you also wanna talk about WebEx meetings for club members. Yes. One, one of our members um, approached us on the board and said, you know, there are some operating groups who may not be meeting in person and might like to be able to get together and enjoy, fe and enjoy fellowship with each other virtually. And if any of those groups have their own um, Zoom or WebEx accounts, that works if you do not. And you would still like to meet virtually with members of your operating group. Please let me know because I can, since this, um, since this um, WebEx room is actually owned by our, or being uh, up here for the benefit of the um, division, if you have an operating group that would like to meet virtually, let me know and let me know who your um, chief cook and bottle washer is and I will make that person the host. And as long as you're not meeting on a night when um, this room is in use for something like the division meeting, you all are free to have at it and, and, and enjoy each other's company virtually that way. So just please let me know if you're in an operating group and you'd like to get together because we can certainly make that happen. Okay. All right. Um, Hank, would you like to talk about the train show? Hank? <laughs> uh, Hank is not unmuted. We will unmute Hank. Okay. There we go. There yes. we go. Yes. Well, with the train show, we have moved it from the March date, which we had scheduled earlier, out to October. Um, of course, you know the COVID has caused that to be moved. But, um, you know, sometimes when a door closes, a window opens, or vice versa. And we have gotten a lot more interest in the show now that it is moved to October. 
-hmm. We have more vendors calling and trying to get information and signing up. So we are going to have a great show in October. Therefore, come August, I'm going to be looking for volunteers to come to and work at the show. We will need volunteers for all sorts of things. We're going to need them for helping the set up, moving the vendors in. We're going to need them for certain tables. Um, Walt will need some help with the raffle table. We will need volunteers for ticket selling. We will need volunteers, period. So keep that in your mind. Um, October 2nd, 3rd. Uh, set up date is going to be October Friday, the October 1st. So if you can, come on out. And of course, that gets you free admission. And we'll also give you free parking. <laughs> Parking's free anyway, but you can have free parking with it. Have I okay. forgotten anything, Sally? I I don't think so. I I think it's going along splendidly as far as the changeover of the date goes. Oh yeah, yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna still be in Cartersville. We still have a lovely space. Um, we'll have a total of 146 tables out there, of which 25 have been sold up till today, and um, I think it's gonna be a great time. Yep, it'll be nice. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful building that we're going to have it in. It's so much different than than the Cobb Galleria for ambiance, if nothing else. So oh, yes. Oh yes. Yep. You can actually okay. work it out easily. Yeah. So okay. Well, thank you, Hank. Okay. Um I have a couple of announcements. One is um I got noticed that Fred Coleman has passed away. He was an active member of the Southeast region, and he is also one of the uh, head people to do the Asheville show, um, which is actually happening at the end of February, I think. Yeah. Um, so they're going to dedicate their train show to him. He um, had a heart attack, not COVID related as far as we know. Um, so anyway, he will be missed for sure. I, I worked with him a lot um, when I was on the board. So anyway, um, I also need help with the new flyer that I'm going to be getting uh, printed for the train show dates. Now, the quicker we get the posters out or the flyers out there, the better off we'll be. But it's going to cost about $45 to send them. So I'm asking for volunteers to pick them up at um like uh blue ox and take them to the various places if you're interested in helping me out i have hobby town usa uh, both in duluth and in kennesaw river riverdale station will be getting them blue ox will be getting them legacy station will be getting them and b and b sales i haven't heard back from i don't know if they're still in business or not um but if anybody can help me get posters to these or flyers to these guys it would really be helpful and it probably won't be for a week or more before i even get them printed so we've got some time to arrange it so keep that in the back of your mind and i did want to thank some sponsors that we had for our training camp um we had um, a donation, a gift card donation from trains.com, a gift card donation from Blue Ox Trains, and we also received a percentage off from Micromark for the people who attended the um, training camp online. So those are that's pretty nice to have a little bit of an extra uh, push for the hobby as far as spending money with our hobby shops and, you know, with our um, Micromark. So... Anyway, um, Stefan Bartelski, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, Sally. hold on just a moment because um, John Stevens from NMRA National needs to speak to us for just a moment. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, you have to listen to me. Um, <laughs> I am running the... Uh, 2021 election 
Uh, we opened the election up on the 1st of February. Uh, many of you probably already received your invitation to do so electronically. Um, if you haven't uh, received an invitation to vote, uh, send me an email at elections at nmra.org and I will ensure that you get a ballot either electronically or a paper ballot. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay. All righty. Back to Stefan. Are you ready for your clinic? I am, uh, certainly. Just a moment here. Let me. And, and I've set you as presenter, um, Stefan, so when you're yeah. ready to. I saw that. I'm just going to get rid of my. Uh, um, well, we'll go straight into the. Uh, presentation okay. for you for those of you who do not know Stefan he is one of the di the division Piedmont division members and he gives some pretty good uh, clinics out there for us so all right Stefan when you're ready okay uh, thank you for that Sally no pressure <laughs> okay um, if you uh, <clears throat> If you saw the uh, meeting, and by the way, if you have questions going through this, uh, I would ask you rather than uh, um, talking them in, if you could use the chat button at the bottom of the right hand part of the screen and send it to the group or send it to Perry and Perry, will you collect them and uh, we can handle them at the end? I most certainly will. Okay. So, um, see uh, my uh, my presentation here is called using jmri panels and paperless manifests i have to be honest this is a presentation that was actually given to the nmra opsig uh, a few months ago um, i've updated it with some other information that i've learned since then so it's not exactly the same but if you saw that and obviously you will uh, um, you will recognize it. So using JMRI panels and paperless manifests. Before I go into that, just very quickly, uh, for those of you that don't know me, um, I've kind of come back into the hobby recently at retirement. Um, I was lucky to be the last person to join country uh, roads. If, uh, for those of you that know that before, uh, before it's demise, and for those of you that don't know, we have been trying to sell the modules, but that was not successful. So we've taken the decision that uh, we will be that, that we have closed uh, closed that, and so a number of people have already scavenged their uh, their modules for other things. Um, I first came to the U.S. in the mid uh, or the second half of the 80s for a couple of years and lived over uh, Roswell Way. And there is a line that runs there that goes from Marietta and then up to uh, Blue Ridge. So I always had a bit of a, you know, bit of a connection with that uh, particular line. And so that's what I chose uh, to model. Um, the, the danger of this sounding like, uh, like the Oscars, there are a few people that I have to thank. Um, one thing about, I would like to say about our hobby is um, everybody helps everybody. This is, you know, a very nice hobby to be in. Everybody's very friendly. But there are some specific names that I would like to mention. Um, Scott Sabo, who introduced me to using track warrants uh, managed by a JMRI panel. And uh, Steve Todd, many people know him as Mr. Raspberry Pi. He showed me and let me just see. I think you're probably seeing Perry there, and I'm trying to find a way. There we are. Okay, now we're good. Um, he showed me how to do, or he had a clinic actually. I think in, um, I think in our autumn SER X, uh, Perry. I don't know if you can remember. Anyway, called paperless JMRI switch list, and I found a way to combine those two, and that's what we'll talk about tonight. Uh, Tom Klamoski, some of you know him and his uh, 
Georgia Northeastern Railroad, which is essentially the same line that I'm doing, just a different era, due to me to operations. So that, uh, that was, uh, the, and then of course, everybody else in the hobby, both my country roads group, people at the NRA meetings, it's just, uh, it's a great hobby to be in. And I like doing this because it's a way to give back to everybody who's helped me or get back to the hobby on behalf of everybody that's helped me. So my line is based on what's known as the LNN Etowa Old Line. Uh, just very quickly, it started as an narrow gauge line. This means tight curves and steep gra grades. It's also known as the Hukunai Division. Um, some of you I think two summers ago might have taken part in the scale trains um, tour that uh, we went over the Hiawasi Loop. You can see the picture, uh, the upper picture there. This is where the line goes round the mountain and then over a trestle over itself. And of course, you've got that uh, big loop in California that everybody knows that uh, I think it's the UP uses a lot, but we have our own right here, not in Georgia, but in uh, it is actually a, just across the state line in Tennessee. The Etowah line started as a gauge line, but very early on was converted to standard gauge, but it still has tight curves and steep grades. So you're unlikely to see six axle diesels on there because it's just a can't take it. Um, key products, copper up in the Cop Copper Hills and uh, McKaysville, that's up on the state line. Marble from the Tate to Marble lines and uh, Whitestone, which is just above Tate. Uh, grain as well, there's a big pilgrim, uh, pilgrims uh, plant on uh, the line in just outside Canton. And of course, in the day, uh, passengers. The line was shown, uh, sold to the Georgia Northeastern at the end of 1986. Before that, it was l &N, and then obviously family lines. And just around that time was when CSX was actually had combined Chessie and the family lines into one. So I have, my era is actually the month of October 1986. So I am still running in the CSX period, but it gives me the opportunity to have family line, LNN, chassis locomotives, as well as my latest acquisition, which is actually a, a locomotive in CSX livery. And that one, of course, will not be vet weathered very much because for that time period, it had just been painted. Key elements, uh, I talked about the loop. Uh, there's a very nice uh, trestle across Turnip Town Creek. The little river bridge, and that was the one that was behind my head uh, in my little box when when we first started off. Obviously, Copper Hill, McKaysville, with the uh, copper mine there. Uh, the plant, the Georgia Marble plant at Nelson, is quite interesting because basically the the main line goes right through the middle of the plant there. And in the past, although uh, to be honest, by 1986, probably. Most of it had been uh, done away with, but in the past it had as much as six or seven spurs at the Nelson plant where they brought dimension uh, marble, marble from the quarry up to the plant for cutting and shaping. And many of you may know, but if you don't, just let you know, a lot of the marble in Washington, D.C., things like the Capitol and some of some of the monuments, etc., all are made with uh, Tate marble. Okay, so a key operational aspect here is that it is a dark line. It does not have signals. They don't have a CTC. Um, they don't have you know switches that are uh, remotely controlled. Everything is controlled by the brakeman or the conductor uh, on the train. So uh, that kind of drives. Um, you'll see where I'm going to with the magnet board. Sorry about that. Let me just quickly go back. Um, Georgia Marble in the uh, 80s, well, and before that, but up to the 80s, was run as a private short line and they interchanged at Tate. Uh, the branch line goes down a series of switchbacks uh, on the branch, you know, most people think about switchbacks going up. Well, they do go up from the mines, but from the main line, they actually go down, which is kind of different to most 
uh, switchbacks. There are two mines there. The uh, Tate Quarry, which is the open one where they cut out big blocks of uh, marble, and also further up the valley, there's one called the New York Mine, where they basically burrowed into the hill and then they send these big trucks, you know, they uh, uh, use dynamite, take down a whole pile of marble, load up the trucks and bring it out. And most of that is com converted either into aggregate, which is, let's say, gravel sized marble, or into powder because marble gets used a lot, believe it or not, in uh, food stock, things like that. Um, Georgia Marble actually uh, was acquired by, at least the rail line part of it, was acquired by Georgia Northeast, and I think somewhere in the 90s, I don't have an exact date. But it, when they were actually running, they have a nice uh, uh, SW1 switcher, uh, which has a very nice white and blue livery, and I've made a model of that, painted it up um, to, uh, according to some pictures that I found online of that uh, particular uh, engine, and you can see it in that lowest picture down there. Uh, it's crossing my representation of the Little River Bridge. Now that locomotive would almost never get there and definitely not with a train, but uh, it makes a nice picture, I think. So that's the background, the prototype. Now for my uh, layout, it is uh, under construction. See two pictures there, the, the aisle that is half finished, you see the right hand side is sort of about 70% seen it, the left hand side, almost nothing there right now. Then if you go, you can see uh, on that left hand picture, it starts curving off around to the left there. The picture on the right actually shows you where that uh, line comes out. And you can see there, and this is, you know, very, uh, very early on in, in my building, you can see the switchbacks though in the middle of the picture there going down. Those are prototypically a 4% grade, shouldn't be a problem. I had tested out my locomotive pulling four or five uh, cars up a 4% grade, actually a 5% and it seems to do that. Um, but we'll see when, you know, once, it's, once the track's laid, that's gonna be one of the first things I will test. But the good news is because of the switchback, the train lengths are small, so normally, I'll not have more than four or five freight cars on there. It, the leads, the tails on the uh, switchback will handle about four 60 foot uh, cars, you know, covered hoppers. If I have 50 foot uh, or 40 foot uh, hoppers, open hoppers, slightly more. It's a uh, it's designed for operations, so it's point to point, not run bys. Uh, as you can see there, I've got a box on the fascia. I have locks on the uh, mainline turnouts to slow things down. Crews will have master keys and all the locks will have the same, uh, the same keys so they can uh, just open up the lock and, and move the switch. I haven't done this for all switches. If you look at the, the prototype, actually most of the switches are actually locked. I didn't want to slow things down that much. So uh, um, siding, anything off the main line, uh, runarounds, uh, industry spurs, their yards, they're all uh, manually uh, uh, flipped. But I also have a, a one or two or three gates. I've got one now, but I'm going to be having more that I use to uh, lock off sidings and there's a key, same key will be used to open a, a cover like that as well and then there'll be a handle to open uh, the gate. And for operations, all of the fascias do have uh, the track plan on there so that the operating crew know where they're going and where they have to drop stuff off. This is um, uh, Tom Klimoski and I on what I call the inaugural operation uh, operating uh, session. We ran a couple of trains trying out everything. So basically from Elizabeth, which is the interchange with the CSX main line up into Marietta, which you can see me standing next to. We ran a couple of trains with about four or five uh, cars, dropping some off and uh, picking some up just to see how it went and it went. I will be looking in the future for um, 
for folks to uh, come and uh, operate on a regular basis, but uh, not yet. I've got a lot more to do before I go there. So let's go to uh, JMRI. For those that don't know it, it's free software for model railroading. There are three uh, main components to it. Decoder Pro, which is a way to easily program your decoders. Instead of having to work out which CV number and, and especially with indexed uh, decoders, that can be very complicated. Um, Decoder Pro basically gives you a screen with check boxes and you just, or sliders, and you just check or slide what you want and then it'll write it out to you automatically. It'll read what's there, you can see what you've got in your decoder, then you can write it out. If you have a Digitrax decoder, um, they have Sound Pro and that will uh, load sounds and things like that. We can spend much time on that. And the third one is known as Panel Pro. Now, Panel Pro does a lot of things, actually. There are some sub-modules in that. But that's going to be the important one because we're going to talk about uh, panels and uh, operations uh, tonight. So it's Panel Pro, the, the panel part of Panel Pro is designed for creating uh, control panels. And the easiest way to think of this, if you know CTC, especially modern day railroads, they've got this big screen with um, lots of uh, uh, switches on there because the dispatcher there can control the turnouts and he can see where uh, trains are on the, on the computer board, and that's what Panel Pro is designed to do. Also, if you want to have a more old fashioned CTC where they had the switches, but they didn't actually have uh, where the train was, uh, you can mimic that. They even have pictures that look like the real CTC switches. It can connect to signals, turnout controls, block op occupancy sensors, all those sort of things. And this is in the first instance when I was looking at that and I said, well, I don't want to go to the trouble of putting in block occupancy sensors. My particular line does not have signals, it's dark. It doesn't have automated turnout controls. I want the, uh, the crew to actually do it like on the prototype. So I kind of shied away from it. And then like I said, Scott Sabo showed how he used it. And uh, that's what I'm gonna show you tonight as well. So there are two things, there's a panel editor, which is primarily designed for CTC panels and the layout ed editor, which allows you to make track plans with occupancy indication, which is kind of like they have uh, CSX has that big dispatching center in uh, in Jacksonville and they would have, you know, a whole bunch of computer screens and the main line and they can see where everything is and, and that kind of mimics that kind of thing. Panel Pro also includes Operations Pro, which is basically a freight forwarding tool delivery and pickup of uh, freight cars. So it will be, you can ask it to define the train and it'll work out what cars need to go to, you know, whatever's uh, on, the, on, on the route of that train and which, which cars need to get picked up from, uh, from industries that have been left on an earlier train and which, uh, which trains may need to get picked up at the, uh, uh, which freight cars might be uh, picked up from the yard and delivered uh, to the uh, industry. So it's a way of uh, controlling that and it will generate paperwork for you. Um, JMRI calls it a manifest, other people call, call them switch lists, although JMRI has a different kind of paperwork which they call switch lists. But either way, look at it this way, a manifest is just a list of things that a train, so the train crew need to know, pick up, you know, these 10 cars at the yard, take the first three and drop them off at the first uh, town and whatever industries are there and pick up for maybe four other cars from the industries because they are now loaded or they're unloaded, they need to go somewhere else. And it's just a list from town to town to town. Um, but it is paperwork and I'm going to come back to that uh, shortly. So. So let's go have a look here and look at the panel side of things, right? So the way Scott Sabo showed it, he said, and he called it, uh, it's verbal, 
block security. That's the term they use in uh, in Canada. I've also seen a pr another presentation of op OPSIG and somebody said, well, what's happening there is actually direct traffic control. Basically, what it means is that the train radios to the dispatcher and says, for example, if you look down here, I'm in Elizabeth Yard and I'm ready to go and I've got to go up to Marietta first and I need to uh, I need to do some switching there, drop some cars off. And another another word for that is is track warrants. The dispatcher is going to tell the train, okay, you you have authority to go from Mary uh, from Elizabeth to Marietta. Don't go beyond um, a certain point. And in railroad terms, those are mostly done with mile posts. Um, on my layout, I'm actually doing geographic things. So you see there, there's a, uh, a thing that called Web in, uh, Industry Drive, which is actually one in Marietta. And that's kind of the uh, the end of the Marietta block that you would use for, uh, for working. So the dispatcher is going to tell the train they can do that. And the dispatcher just has to make sure that there's not, not another train coming in the opposite direction and that he gives clearance to that one as well. And so what Scott Sago said to keep track of that, what he did, um, he's using it as a magnet board. And his and mine are not connected to the layout. Now, as I said before, JMRI can use block occupancy sensors and it can take and light up those uh, track lines that you see there based on electrical signals coming back from the layout. But that's a lot of electronics, a lot of complication, a lot of wiring, and I didn't want to do that. So this panel is not connected to the layout, but it does provide visual confirmation of clearances. Now, on the prototype, the engineer calls the dispatcher, asks for the clearance, the dispatcher tells him, you know, you're cleared from here to there, you've got to do this, or maybe stop here, and when you get to a certain point, maybe you have to take a certain siding. That, it gets written down on the form, and it's given a number, and then the engineer has to read it back to the dispatcher, so they're absolutely certain that both sides know what they're doing. Now, I'm planning not to use forms because I want to keep it simple for my operating crews. Now, maybe we will do it to make it slightly more prototypical in the future, but I'm going to start and try and not do it. So if we're not using forms, the crews need to have a visual way to see what their clearances are. And so in addition to having the dispatcher in a room away from the rest of the layer, and it's actually if you look to the left of that uh, TV screen in the picture there, there's a door there. He will be behind that door, but that TV that I put up on the screen there is mirroring what the dispatcher sees on his computer. So the, the crews can also see, you know, what their clearances uh, are. Now, uh, Scott Saber showed how he did it. And basically the way it worked is that there is a, in the panel uh, program, there is a way to put a marker on there and put a number in there. So basically the number of your locomotive and place it anywhere you like on the screen and then change the colors of those lines. So let's go. So there's, there you can see the door over on the left and then this TV screen. My uh, wife was doing some rearranging uh, in the house and we had this TV screen in a room for the grandchildren. She said, I don't, this is too big. I don't want this. I said, I'll take it to the charity shop. I said, don't be so quick. I think I might find the use for that. Anyway, so here's a close up of the screen. And here you can see two markers, 6574 and 6611. And basically, what we're showing here is that 6611 is cleared along the route from Elizabeth Yard to Marietta. And then there's a green box here, and you can see to the right of Marietta, it says working. That means they are cleared into Marietta, and I haven't actually changed the color of those tracks because this 6611 is going to be all over Marietta um, doing uh, the dropping cars off and picking them off from uh, 
from industries. There's no yard at Marietta, but there are industries. And so that block basically means that whole block is available for the train uh, that's uh, going to be working there, which is 6611. Note on this track plan that I have um, that I only have the main line and the passing sidings and then an indication of where industry spurs go off. And, and there could be three or four industries off one of those turnouts. There could only be one. It just depends on what's there. But that's, that, you know, the crew has a full uh, track plan on the fascia, so they know where to take stuff. And as far as the operations go, we just need to know roughly where they where they are. So very quickly explanation here. The white track means track which is available. The yellow tracks are ones that have been allocated to the train. And the locomotive number is showing there um, near that line. So 6574 knows that it's cleared through Woodstock and then holds just outside Marietta. As I said before, the green box is a reservation for a whole area for a train to switch. A gray, gray track up uh, behind this black box. That's a future expansion. I, I built this panel and I was going to start running the railroad up to a white stone. That was my plan. I have since changed that plan. I'm not going to finish all the bench work and lay all the track work. So in the near future, I have to change this panel to have all white uh, uh, all white track work. And you also see some blue line here and some of the locations are in blue and that's because those are for uh, the Georgia Marble Railroad. The Georgia Marble Railroad does not fall under control of the CSX dispatcher except when it comes up to Tate and also when it goes from Tate to either Nelson or from Tate to Whitestone those two industries are going to be handled by Georgia Marble only. I don't know if it was like that in the prototype. I know today it's not, but um, it just makes it more interesting for uh, operations. And rule number one, it's my layout, so I'll do what I want. So we can see here now, we're now a bit further, 6611 did its switching at Marietta and was instructed by the dispatcher to go into the siding. So you can see here the yellow line here. And then 6574 that was waiting uh, just past Woodstock was cleared to go down the main line into Marietta and then hold there. And then 6611 is now cleared to go up through Woodstock and then up to Tate and do some switching there and 65.7 can go down to Elizabeth Yard. So uh, this is what, how the crews can see, you know, what they're supposed to be doing. Now, for those of you that may have looked at um, layout editor or even panel editor, um, there is a certain learning curve and there's no way I would even think of trying to do this clinic uh, to teach you how to build a panel. But here are some kind of things that what if you want to learn building panels, you can then start on a very simple fashion and build yourself just a simple line, maybe one or two turnouts um, and then start. You can come back and read this and see what I did to kind of give you an idea of what you can do to make something similar if that's what you if that's what you would like to do. Um, I will be giving you at the end of this presentation a link to this presentation so you can go online and see it. So you don't need to write everything down here on the screen. Um, you will be able to access uh, that online. And also I'm available for uh, questions uh, um, if you have some be very happy to help you set something up similar. Some key things, right? Blocks can have three colors. I'm only using two, unoccupied and occupied. I'm hoping in a way that I might be able to get a third color, which I'd like to use for the Georgia Marble one. So when a train is, a Georgia Marble train is running on the, on the main line track, let's say from Marietta, where they join the main line to Nelson or back up to 
to up north to Whitestone, um, that the track will turn blue instead of yellow. But that's something right now. It's going to be yellow even for the Georgia Marble trains. But maybe in the future I can uh, get that uh, changed. Um, I said that Chair Marai can uh, read and recognize block occupancy sensors, and the panel program actually then has a sensor which you can link to a block occupancy sensor. But you can also define a sensor without a electronic attached to it, and by clicking on it, it will actually, it, it's like uh, an electronic one said, oh yeah, there's a train here. It will say, okay, there's a train here. And that's how you change the color of the track. So again, this panel is not connected to the layout, but you're still kind of simulating that. Um, talked about, uh, there are some other details here, which will only make sense if you start working with the panel, but talked about the work around uh, rectangles. And what I do with that, I make a special block, which basically has four tracks in a in a rectangle like that, and it has its own sensor. And instead of having a dot, you can see on this on the panel, there's a lot of dots. Those dots are the sensors. But up here, you click on uh, on the text next to Tate. Um, that is actually also a sensor, but it's a text sensor. And what it will do is actually change the text as well. Uh, Thick tracks are mainline, thin tracks are uh, sidelines in JMRA terms or a siding. Uh, just so that's just so uh, so you know. You don't have to do that. I find it convenient. You could just make everything thick or everything thin, whatever you like. Now, some lessons that I learned building the panel. It took me, I have to say, let's say working a couple of hours every evening, it probably took me a week to 10 days to really get to where I could build the panel that you see there. What I would say is start slowly, build a simple panel first. That's really important. Um, just play around with it. You can just add to it, add to it. So you might build something that's part of your layout, but don't try and build the whole layout at once. That will overwhelm you. You'll get very frustrated. You'll get confused. Um, JMRI has very good help. So read them when you're doing a particular task, creating a sensor, creating a turnout, uh, doing this, doing that. Read the, the help section at least twice and then again when it's not working the way you want. The help is very good, sometimes a little complicated, so that's why I say read it multiple times. There is a, a JMRI forum at Groups.io. You can get there from the JMRI website, which is jmri.org, O-R-G, probably the easiest to remember. If you join the forum, there's a bunch of people there that are absolute JMRI gurus. And so if, uh, you know, if you have a question, if you would have a question for me and I can't answer it, then I would say go to the JMRI group because you're 99% certain someone will be able to help you there. When you're building a panel, store the panels. Um, JMRI doesn't save panels. There's a reason for that. I'm not going to go into that. But there is a, a, an action called store. Use the store often because it makes uh, a backup with a date and timestamp. So if you move on and then you say, you know what, I added this and this and this, and now it's really a mess, you can actually easily go back. Um, the other other thing that I, I would like to pass on, I'll, I'll skip the one about the separate profile. You can read that and you'll see that if you start for yourself. Just do it in the normal JMRI profile. The other one is the panel has a zoom value. So you can make whatever your layout is fit the screen by zooming in or out. Normally you don't want to zoom out because that just makes everything a lot smaller. You actually normally want to zoom in. But, and you can store the panel with with a uh, with that zoom value. And when you open it up next time, it'll open up exactly in the right size. However, sometimes you do something and it gets lost. Well, don't panic. 
All you do is go back to the zoom command, zoom to whatever level you had before, and then store again, and then it'll it'll work for the next uh, month or two. So that's using that's using the panel as a uh, as a magnet uh, board, and you move the markers around. The dispatcher would move the markers around. He would put the uh, you know put the colors on the, on piece of track to show that it's occupied by a train. But then I ran into something else, and I mentioned earlier the paperless manifest, and I found out that in JMRI there was going to be a way to automate the markers. So let me show you that. We're going to go to paperless manifests now. So for those of you that don't know JMRI ops or JMRI operations or Operation Pro, it's called also. Um, JMRI normally will print a manifest and over on the left, I've got a manifest there. So you can see from my Blue Ridge line, this is train Z001. It goes from Elizabeth to Edowa. I've used abbreviations there. Uh, you can see the date that it's valid on. And, and by the way, notice my uh, layout is set in 1986. That's just a nice little thing that JMRI does and says, tell me your, your year and I'll put that in all the dates instead of the, uh, the normal ones. And so it says, okay, so your scheduled work at Elizabeth Yard is pick up the locomotive and then pick up a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, freight cars and then depart northbound with 10 cars. It's going to be this prototype number of feet in length and it has this weight. It calculates the weight for you. Not going to go into how it does that. That's a totally other JMRI operations uh, clinic. Um, if you want to learn about that, and it says when you get to Marietta, here's what you need to do. You need to set out this one freight car and no pickups, and on you go to the next one. And then at Tate, you can do another set out. And then when you get up to Jasper, there's going to be a pickup. So this basically this is the work list for the crew. So that's the standard one. It's paperwork, as I said earlier before. It means you can, uh, I have some clipboards and I have created them. Um, you can have a clipboard. You can have a pen or a pencil to check off what you've done. And you can have somewhere, I've got to put hooks everywhere so you can hang up the clipboard and you can do the paperwork. And then you have to, uh, uh, you know, let the dispatcher know that you finished at one place and moving on to the next. So it's, I mean, it works and it's perhaps prototypical, but it can be a little cumbersome. So when uh, Steve Todd held his clinic about paperless manifest, I thought, well, that's interesting. It may not be prototypical for my era because in my era, the uh, conductor wouldn't be walking around with an iPad or something like that, but it does make things easier for the operators. And the nice thing about choosing this approach, if one operator says, well, I don't want to use an iPad or a smartphone to do the manifests, I'd rather do it on, on a clipboard, you can still do it. So that's operator choice. But if you're going to use the paperless function, it uses something called the conductor function in JMRI, and JMRI has its own web server. So basically, on your network, you just pull up a browser and you go to a certain address which is in the documentation and um, it reads basically what JMRI Operations Pro has built in terms of train. And what what's nice about this, when a, uh, a train crew has done it on a smartphone or on a tablet and checks off that they picked up all the freight cars and then says we're moving to the next town, um, it updates JMRI and JMRI knows that things are moving. And as I said before, Operations Pro is also connected to the panel so that it can move a marker representing that train to the next work location. Now, one thing is different. You may remember when we looked at the manual way of doing it, it had the lo locomotive number. 
difference here that you're going to see instead of the locum number, it's actually going to have the train name. So let's go. So here's some pictures that I took off of my uh, smartphone. And you can see over on the left here, it's my layout, the Blue Ridge line, as it's called. And there was, at the time, in JMR operations, there was one train defined called Z001 going from Elizabeth to Etowa, which is the same as that piece of paper that I showed you. So that piece of paper that you saw is pretty much the same as you're going to see on this, what I would call semi-online. We're not actually on the internet, we're just on the local network in your home, but it's still kind of on loan. And these, this shows you uh, the trains that have been created or built in JMRI terms. There's only one built on for this example. And so you click on C001 and it'll pull up that train. It says, okay, this train starts from Elizabeth Yard and the next location will be Marietta. And what does it have to do at Elizabeth Yard? Remember that was on the paper manifest. It says, okay, depart the north, departs uh, Elizabeth Yard going north with 10 cars, 634 feet and 771 tons. Remember that was on the paper as well. So it says, pick up the GP9 from the Elizabeth service uh, uh, track and then pick up these box cars and here it's actually telling you where they are the the manifest the paper manifest does that as well i didn't really uh, show you that but here you can see it's saying okay the box car is going to uh, come from track four and then track three and so they're going to shuffle them around and jmri puts them in a particular sequence which is related to where they're going so you probably want to block them as much as possible in this sequence and now the conductor knows what he has to do and he can tell the engineer and they can work on this and when they're ready and they've built the train so you see z001 is over here and because z001 appeared on the screen the dispatcher knows that somebody has actually taken that train they clicked on that icon on the on the previous screen Right, they clicked on that, and that automatically puts Z001 in the marker here, and it puts it here in Elizabeth Yard. So then the dispatcher says, okay, I'm going to block this part of the track, and in this, uh, this example, I have actually made yellow all of the tracks in Marietta, you know, even though the block uh, is a random. We say, okay, and then the guys that are running Z001 know that they've been cleared through to Marietta and they can go work at Marietta. So, the conductor says, okay, we've collected all of these. He checks off all the cars that he has. If he can't find one, he'll just say, okay, well, we'll have to leave it behind and he wouldn't check it. But he's checked everything and he will then click on move to Marietta because now he's ready to go. And he says, engineer, you're cleared through to uh, Marietta, we'll do the next piece of work. And what will happen then is that uh, JMRI will actually move the Z001 icon through to Marietta. So at that point, the dispatcher can see that the train moved it, and he knows it won't be there immediately, so there's no rush. But once it's in Marietta and uh, again, I'm not intending to use radios on or phones on my thing, but the fact that he's just behind the door, if they really want to, they can yell, okay, I'm in Marietta and I'm almost done, so just make sure that we've got the next clearance, the next warrant through to the to the next town, which would be Tate in this case. And uh, so that way, this marker will move down the track automatically again without any connection electronic connection to the layout the only connection is actually to the conductor's smartphone or ipad or, or android tablet that is actually running the paperless uh, manifest so 
like I said, to me, it makes it simple. Instead of a clipboard, they're carrying a tablet. Still got to find somewhere to put the tablet down, but um, it's a lot easier to do. Not, not lots of paper and whatever. Um, there is a little bit of setup uh, required. Uh, again, until you've built a panel, it, this isn't going to mean a lot. So I put this in the presentation. So if you come back later, you can start doing that. But what you will see when you set up something called a route in Operations Pro, um, which defines the towns that a particular train, the locations that a particular train will go, there is also a place to set train icon coordinates. And that basically is how um, Operations Pro knows how to move that marker along the panel. Because when, when, uh, when the conductor clicked on that move to Marietta, Operations Pro looks and says, oh, Marietta, that Z001 should be at this XY coordinates on the panel. And you uh, set, them, uh, set them up. And like I said, this is not intended as a uh, as, as a clinic on how to do this, but more just to give you some food for thought. And if you really want to know how to do it, like I said before, read the JMRI help documentation. It, it's complicated sometimes, but it does tell you every, almost everything you need to know. And feel free to contact me in the future. Now, um, here are some lessons learned around this paperless manifest. First of all, define the routes without the uh, XY coordinates for the markets. Make sure that your JMRI is working, uh, your Operations Pro is working correctly before you start messing around with that. Uh, there is a function called place test icons as you're adding the, num the XY numbers in, so you can check to see whether or not you've set them uh, correctly. And as I mentioned on the prior screen, because you got to remember, you have trains running in two directions. I have north and south. So I, I want the northbound ones to go to the left hand side of, of the town, Marietta or Tate. And I want the southbound marker to be on the right hand side. So if I have a train in the passing siding and, and one on the main line, the markers will not overlap. Um, then once you've defined one set of uh, icon uh, positions for a route, you can use something called update routes to, uh, to replicate it through all other routes that go through those locations. Um, and you can also use a save function, which will mean anytime you create a route with, uh, let's say, Tate in it, it will have the right numbers in there automatically. One thing to remember, those markers are not very large. So you only want to have a train name which has six characters or, or less. So the uh, Orange Blossom Special, not really going to work. Uh, JMRI will put it up there, but it will extend outside the boundaries of the, uh, it'll extend outside the boundaries of the marker. And that doesn't look too good. So, It'll do six characters. I try to keep it to four. By the way, the colors of the markers um, are something that you can define. Um, northbound to me are white. Southbound are, I think, yellow or green. No, green or red. Anyway, another color. Uh, when you're switching, uh, and a switching move is basically if you have a train that only works within a particular location. So let's say you have one that's uh, only doing uh, switching at Tate. Uh, you have a train defined for that. It will be yellow. And the Georgia model train marker is uh, blue. Sorry about that. Go back. Anyway. Now we're going backwards for some reason. Apologies for that. There we go. And that is pretty much it. So here's my email address. 
for those of you that would like to uh, send me questions if you do uh, start doing this. Um, if you would like to view this presentation, this is the one thing I would say write down. That's HTTP bit.ly slash BRL Blue Ridge line dash opsic. And you do have to get the capitals, the uppercase and lowercase correct, I believe, to uh, to find it. So make sure you write that down uh, carefully. And then you can also see the original presentation that Scott Sabo gave. Uh, he has a bit more detail than mine where I got some of the ideas from. And also uh, Steve Todd's has a few more details in there. So I put the, added those two. You can use those if you if you do go to this uh, website and then you can pick up those two uh, connections. Also, Thomas Klamoski has a, um, a blog and he has information about the line. If you're interested in the uh, Etowa Old Line that goes from uh, Etowa down to Marietta or and today very much uh, from basically from Marietta up to Whitestone, which is just south of uh, um, LJ. Uh, and then of course the Blue Ridge scenic line that goes from Blue Ridge up to Copper Hill. And then uh, there's also the uh, Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum that goes from Etowa down the line across the loop and ends up at uh, Copper Hill uh, as well. Anyway, so those, that's my uh, the, uh, Perry. Any questions? Yes, sir. And and thank first of all, thank you very much. That was very interesting, and that's something that I, and what you are doing is something I will be headed towards. Because, and this is a good time for me to do it because right now we're not having operating sessions. But the but the. The question, a couple of at least one question came in. If yep. you already have an inventory in Excel um, of your freight cars, can you import or can you import that into JMRI? Yes, you can. Now there are some instructions on how to do that because you need to make sure that your Excel sheet has certain columns that go into certain fields in JMRI. That so makes you, sense. You may have to add to it, but in a lot of cases, the main ones are there. For example, the road abbreviation, the number, right, of the freight car, those are there. The freight car type, you probably already have. So you can do all of those, but there are instructions in the help, and if you want to, the forum is a very good place. If it doesn't work for you the way you expect, you can wipe everything out and then go to the forum and ask people for help there. But yes, you can do that. Very cool. And um, Scott Pavla posted um, JMRI org, the help section. Um, so it's there in the chat session. Also remember that this entire presentation has been recorded so if you want to go back once it's up on on our division YouTube page if you want to go back and look at for example this particular page that shows um, Stefan's email address um, the presentation it's its original format and Scott and Steve's information also Thomas Komoski's information is all in the recorded presentation so you can um, bring this up. You'll be able to bring this up on YouTube and pause on this page for however long you want to to read. Yeah, yeah. And sorry, I'd forgotten about that. So, but they can also see this whole presentation. There, of course, it'll be without the audio. So, uh, if they want the audio, they can uh, they can get that from the uh, from the video. Yes, sir. Sally. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Stefan. Okay, my pleasure. Yes. Um, close on uh, on on that on that screen the panel. So uh, um, it was fun building it. It was fun learning about it. And, uh, hopefully, I may see some of you once I start operating. Uh, my own stretch goal is to at least have track down by the end of the year enough to to warrant more operating sessions. There may not be scenery. There definitely won't be buildings. But we will we will have fascia, and that will tell you 
what each siding represents. So I will, you know, the I think that board that we once we have face to face face meetings again, I will put on that board. Need help? Uh, I need people to come operate. So, wow, that'll be fun. That'll be fun. Okay. Well, I have just um, two announcements left. Um, the Asheville Model Train Show. I looked it up. It's the twenty sixth and twenty seventh of February, and it is up in that um, Ashworth or in Fletcher, actually, North Carolina. And then our next visual clinic or virtual clinic, I should say, is Father Tim. Now, Perry, can you give us a hint as to what that is? Yes, ma'am, I certainly can. Um, Father Tim will provide um, a basic overview of 3D printing. He's going to cover the capabilities of 3D 3D printing, the design process, and steps to successfully produce items via 3D printing. Um, he's also going to show us examples of his work. Very nice. That will be very interesting. Okay. Well, I think that will do it for tonight. I want to thank everybody for for uh, listening in, and again for Stefan and his clinic. It was very interesting. Thank you very much. And a, note, and a note in here is that Georgia Marble was purchased by the GNRR in 1998. And okay. I just thank uh, Raymond for that information. I will correct my presentation. That's what uh, it's a learning process. That's what's fun about this. Well, and that, that's what, what I was saying earlier about sharing in this uh, hobby. It's uh, That's one of the things that I like about uh, being in this hobby. Everybody yep. is always so helpful. So thanks to everyone, both tonight, but also stuff you've helped me in the past. Thanks a lot. Very good. Thank you. Everybody have a good evening now. Okay. See you all. All right. Thank Bye -bye. you, Stefan. Bye. Good evening, Barry. So, I th yeah, that was interesting. Thank you. Yeah, that was cool. It's good. It's good. Yep. Thank you for doing, Perry. Not a problem. That's why we're here. Good job. All right. See you guys later. Have a good evening. Have a good evening, Walt. Hey, Walt. Yes, Walt, sir. How you How you feeling? Oh, I'm great, man. I'm back. I'm all healthy again. Janet is too. We're both doing good. We're good. So, yeah. Yeah, we're good. It was kind of a short stint, so it wasn't too bad. It's bad while it lasted, but <laughs> so we're all good. Glad to hear you're better. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you're down there helping uh, LB's state. I'm glad you're able to help her with some of that stuff, but I know that it is a tough challenge, John. It really yeah. is. Yeah. Um, yeah they're, they're, that's what I was saying earlier. It's kind of a you're dealing with members, families, and things like that. It's totally different. So, well, and you know, fortunately, I knew, I knew LB pretty well, and and I met her a number of times. So, you mm -hmm. know, but yeah, you're right. You have to be careful. Um, and fortunately, she's not, she's not moving, mm -hmm. so there's no real rush to do this. So we're kind of. Uh, kind of looked at doing eBay in the beginning, but then when I saw how much stuff there was, I was like, now we're. No, I'll be about, shipping, uh, and shipping right now is extraordinarily expensive to ship anything. Yeah. Well, and I'd be like a hundred by the time we got got rid of all this stuff. So. <laughs> yeah, and you wouldn't get any work done though. on your railroad. Hey, ain't that the truth? Because I got to be be Perry Lamb before he gets MMR. So, uh huh. And that, and that's really exactly what you just said. Is it can turn into a full time job, and it, it's not. It's you know it's it'll take all your time. So, but. yeah, we we've doing we've doing it one day a week for about three or four hours every time. Um, but uh, you know, I mean, we've been doing it for like six weeks. Yeah, um, and it's, we it's almost tough. got everything done. So everything inventory. So now we're trying to figure out, you know, prices and all that other stuff. And yeah. so, anyway, I'll keep you advised. We're hoping maybe bulk. in March. Yeah, sell in bulk. That's the trick. Yeah. Yeah. 12s and 20s. <laughs> <laughs>
So, all right. See you all. All right, you guys. Y'all have a good night. Enjoy the rest of your dinner, Gary. Night, guys. Good night.